In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. I like to welcome all of you in St. Mary and St. Moses Abbey. And I hope the time you spend it here full of spirituality. And I'm sure you know the difference between visiting or staying in a retreat center or staying in a monastery. Staying in a monastery, it's a place for reunion with God, place of spirituality, place in which actually we remember how our fathers forsook everything in the world and forsook the whole world and came to live in a solitary life with God. While we are here, try to enjoy being actually separate completely from the world and united only with God. Especially now we are in the Holy Great Fast. And this fast is one of the most important fasts in the Church. Especially we fast like our Lord Jesus Christ who fasted 40 days and 40 nights. So we fast like Him 40 days and 40 nights and we will explain today why we are fasting. First question I'd like to answer, if the Lord fasted 40 days, why we are fasting 55 days? In Egypt actually, the people used to fast 40 days plus the Holy Week. 40 days plus the Holy Week. Then some people went, they used to go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Holy Resurrection feast there and the Holy Week there. They found them, they fast eight weeks. Eight weeks means 55 days because eight by seven is 56. And I will explain why it became 55, not 56. When they returned back to Egypt, most of them said, you know, since I visited Jerusalem and I visited the Holy Sepulchre and I visited the place of Golgotha, I will fast like the people in Jerusalem. And gradually, many people start to fast the Holy Great Fast like in Jerusalem, eight weeks. Then actually, it was decided that all the cups in Egypt to fast eight weeks. In the fourth century, there was a lady visited Jerusalem and visited Egypt, and she wrote her notes. Her name is Nigeria, and she mentioned that the Egyptians fast eight weeks, and this was in the fourth century. And Saint Severus of Antioch, who came and hid himself in Egypt from the persecution. Also, he mentioned that when he went to Egypt, he found them fasting eight weeks. So why they fasted eight weeks? As you know, we fast, we abstain from eating and drinking five days only, from Monday to Friday. But Saturday and Sunday, there is no abstinence. Saturday and Sunday, there is no abstinence. But we abstain from Monday to Friday. So they said, if the Lord abstained for 40 days, then we need to abstain 40 days. So in order to abstain 40 days, then we need to fast eight weeks because five by eight, five days per week. Per eight, it's 40 days, right? And then there is one Saturday we fasted, the bright Saturday. So if you deduct the bright Saturday, this one, one Saturday that we abstain from the 56 days, it will be 55 days. That is the explanation why we fast 55 days, which actually sending us a very important message. 
that abstinence is a very important element in fasting. Fasting for us is not only to change the food, but abstinence is a very important element. That's why they fasted eight weeks in order to abstain 40 days exactly. Pope Shenouda used to say, if we don't abstain at all, then you are vegans or vegetarians, but not fasting. Even the first meal that we eat in the day, we call it what? Breakfast. Breakfast means what? Break the fast. So breaking the fast. So I want you to train yourself with the guidance of your spiritual father to abstain for some time. Yeah, all of you are young and youth, so I think you can easily, easily abstain till 12 noon. And then maybe you can increase. In the church actual regulation, the holy great fast people or believers should abstain until sunset, until 6 p.m. So even when I say 12 noon or even 1 or 2 or 3 p.m., actually we did not meet the regulation of the church. If you attend to the liturgy today, you will find them, they prayed until the 12th hour and the veil in the monasteries. Because the liturgy should end actually around sunset, like right now. Train yourself to abstain. If coffee is very important for you, and you have to drink coffee every day, this means, in a way, you are enslaved to a certain habit. And that's not good. Train yourself to set yourself free from drinking coffee or drinking tea. Or just train yourself. And you can start again with the guidance of your spiritual father from 12, 1, 2, 3, etc. Why do we fast? Fasting actually has two dimensions. The ascetic dimension and the spiritual dimension. The ascetic dimension has actually three points. The amount of food, the quantity of food, and the abstinence. You need to control these three things. You need to abstain decide to control the amount of food and the quantity of food. We spoke about abstinence and its importance, then about the quality of food. The idea is to humble yourself. The idea is to put yourself, especially your body, under the control of the spirit. As St. Paul said, the spirit fights or wars against the flesh, and the flesh wars against the spirit. And all of us, we experience this war. For example, in the morning, your spirit wants to come early and to come to the church and to attend midnight praises. But the body tells you, no, you are tired. Just get some rest, get some sleep. It's okay. Just attend the liturgy. No need to go to midnight praises. You know? And then some of us we yield to the pressure of the flesh. When you, you pray, you stand for prayer, and then your flesh tell you, Oh, liturgy is too long, midnight praises is too long. What about just sit down? Sit down and pray while you are seated. And we hear in the divine liturgy, before whom the angel and the stand, the angels, the archangels, the principalities, the authorities, the thrones, the dominions. So they are standing around the throne of God, but who are sitting. And then the flesh will tell you, just rest your head on the pew. So you start resting your head and then start sleeping. You ask your friend to wake you at the time of communion to, to go and get communion. 
and then if you, you attended the liturgy while you were sleeping the whole liturgy. So there is a war between the flesh and the spirit, a continuous war. When you control the flesh, as St. Paul said, I discipline my flesh and bring it to subjection, lest after I preach it others, I myself be rejected or be disqualified. So if St. Paul is concerned, lest he becomes disqualified, we should be concerned. And St. Paul wants actually to bring the flesh under the authority of the spirit. I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest after I preach others, I myself be disqualified. So he disciplined himself. In the quality of food, we go back to the food that God gave Adam and Eve when he created them. If you read in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, when God created Adam and Eve, he appointed only to, to them to eat vegetables and fruits. That's all. God added the meat later on in Genesis chapter 9, after the flood. So from Adam till Noah, the people did not eat meat at all. When actually we fast, we go back to the food that God actually gave to Adam and Eve during the time of creation. And it's very important actually to keep the food simple. Many of us, we try to prepare meals similar to what we're eating in the non-fasting days. So what is the point? Are you going to spoil your flesh or to discipline your flesh? Are you going to bring your flesh to subjection or going to just please your flesh and give your flesh what the flesh needs? Why it is important to discipline your flesh? When your flesh desire any sin or any lust, then when actually you are able to say to the flesh no regarding food, you will be able to say to your flesh no regarding any other sin or any other lustful thought. Because your flesh now is compliant, listens. You say yes when you tell the flesh no, I want to drink wine, I want to dance, I want to date, I want, and you say to your flesh no, the flesh will listen. But if you are pleasing the flesh and meeting all the expectation of the flesh, then when the flesh demands any sin or any bad desire, you will not be able to say no to the flesh. Fasting actually increases your will, make you strong through the grace of God to say no to the desires of the flesh and put the flesh under the authority of the spirit. In the same way, you need to discipline your flesh regarding the amount of food, not only the quality. We spoke about abstinence, quality of food or the type of food you are eating, and also about the amount of food. You need to eat what is very important and essential for your functions, to be able to perform all your functions. More than this, no, it's wrong. I know many people, for example, they don't snack between lunch and dinner at all. They eat what's required only to function properly. And that's it. You need actually to exercise these three dimensions in asceticism. Abstinence, amount of food, and the quality or the type of food. Simplicity is very important during fasting. And the church encourages us also during fasting to donate and to do charitable deeds. You may ask me, but I pay my tithe regularly. 
So what is the difference during the time of fasting? Because I pay my tithe regularly. Actually, if you fast in an ascetic way, you will be able to save some money. I mean the budget, the money that you spend for eating during fasting day should be less than the money you spend during the non-fasting days. For example, if you drink coffee every morning, and now you are not going to drink a coffee because you are fasting, and you save the money just for the coffee, just for the coffee. And you say, this money, I will give it to the poor, actually, in addition to my tithe that I pay. I think any one of you at least spend four or five dollars every day for coffee. In 55, this means about 250 dollars, just from saving the money for the coffee. What I'm trying to say, here you need, during fasting, you need to do charitable deeds and you need to give to the poor more than what you give every month. In the pre-fast Sunday, we heard in the gospel about fasting, prayer, and charitable deeds. And the whole fasting we hear, blessed are the merciful on the poor. Because in fasting, actually, we feel for others. We feel for others. In Isaiah 58, verse 3, they asked God, Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls, and you take no notice? So God did not notice. Of course, God noticed. God is all knowledgeable. But here, as if God did not notice that the people were fasting. He did not see that they are fasting. And sometimes we feel the same, as if God did not notice that I am fasting. And God answered them. And he told them, in fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure. You are pleasing yourself. And instead of disciplining yourself, you are pleasing yourself. You find pleasure. Then the Lord told them, the fasting I am expecting, is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked, that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh? That's fasting. Fasting and charitable deeds go hand in hand together. You need to think how you you save money to give it to the poor during the time of fasting. Not only from coffee and tea, but maybe from just not purchasing new clothes during the time of fasting. And you save this money to give it to the poor. So you need actually to figure out how to save money during fasting when you are living a ascetic life during fasting in order actually to give this money in addition to your monthly tithe to the poor. Because that is the fasting the Lord actually is expecting from us. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh, then the light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Here you will be enlightened in your life. You will feel the light of the Lord in your heart. He will heal you spiritually from the illness of sin and from the corruption of sin. You will be a new person in your relationship with God. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. 
you shall cry and he will say here I am that is what the fasting that the Lord is expecting from you I told you fasting has two dimensions one dimension is the ascetic dimension and we spoke about three things here about abstinence about the type of food and about the amount of food what is the spiritual dimension of fasting fasting actually is a time of repentance and spiritual nourishment nurturing our souls in fasting as i told you it is a time to discipline your flesh and to be able to say no to the desires of the flesh so fasting is a time of repentance and before we fasted the great fast we fasted three days like the Ninevites we remember how the Ninevites repented and returned back to God and God had mercy on them and he lifted his wrath away from them and forgave them their sins and in the fraction during the Holy Great Fast actually there is a verse about the Ninevites fasting and prayer are those which the Ninevites pursued they repented and God lifted his wrath from them and forgave them their sins in Isaiah 58 the Lord speaks also about their repentance when he said is this not the fast that I have chosen to lose the bond of wickedness to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke if I am bound with wickedness I am bound with a bad habit I am enslaved to a bad sin through fasting through the power I receive from God in fasting the power to say no to the temptation of the devil through this power I will be able to break the bonds of wickedness the Bible tells us if the Son sets you free you will be free so here through the grace of God I will be able to break the bonds of wickedness and to undo the heavy burdens sin like a burden heavy burden on our shoulder and I'm sure all of you who repent and confess their sins regularly before repentance and confession you feel like you are carrying a heavy burden there is a heavy burden in your shoulder and after you repent and go meet Abuna and confess your sins and take communion you feel like this heavy burden was taken from your shoulder and literally it is taken from your shoulder and placed upon whom? placed upon the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the Lamb of God who carried the sins of the whole world so the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross he carried your sins in advance your sins actually were placed on his shoulder here the Lord Jesus Christ actually died for our sins as John the Baptist said behold the Lamb of God who carries the sins of the whole world in fasting when we repent this burden of sins are removed from you and placed on the shoulder of the Lord Jesus Christ when David said to Nathan the prophet I have sinned against the Lord Nathan told him a very important word he told him and the Lord transferred your sin away from you he said transferred transferred transfer to whom? transfer means removed from him to some place else the sins are transferred from David 
and from each one of us to the shoulder of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who carries the sins of the whole world. Then in Isaiah 58, verse 6, he said, That is the fasting I have chosen. Lose the bonds of wickedness, undo the heavy burdens, let the oppressed go free. Satan actually, in sin, he oppresses us. Especially when we are oppressed under bad habit. People who are taking drugs, or smoking, or addicted to alcohol. They are oppressed under the sin. Satan actually tortures them under such sins. But again, in fasting, there is power, power that we receive from God to be set free from this oppression, to enjoy the true liberty. Because he actually who commits the sin is a slave of sin, as the Bible teaches us. If you are gossiping, judging others, bad-mouthing others, slandering others, cursing, swearing, lying, you are oppressed by these sins. But when you enjoy the liberty in Christ, when you, you enjoy this freedom in Christ, then you will praise God because now you are not enslaved to any of these sins. It is like a yoke. You know what's the yoke? It's a yoke when the animals actually, like cows, they pull a carrot. So they put like a piece of wood on their shoulder. That's what we call the yoke. When we commit sin, we are under this yoke. When actually we repent, this yoke is broken. That's why it says to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. You break every yoke. Every yoke. You are not under the yoke of of anything. Fasting is a time of repentance. Time of repentance. But that's only one dimension. The other dimension in the spiritual aspect of fasting is to nourish and to nurture your spirit. Because if there is war between two persons, in order for one to win this fight, he has to be strong and the other weak. If two are weak, then nobody will win. Right? So if you discipline your flesh, but your spirit is weak, then your spirit will not win the war. You want your spirit to win the war against your flesh. So while you are bringing your flesh into subjection and disciplining your flesh, you need to feed, to nurture your spirit to be strong. That's why during the time of fasting, you need actually, again with the guidance of your spiritual father, to have a certain rule, a spiritual rule, or a certain canon to nurture your spirit. Regarding prayer, regarding reading the scripture, spiritual reading, and prostration, don't waste your time during fasting. Either you are a student or you are working, try during fasting to stay away from any unnecessary social activities. Fasting is a time to retreat with the Lord. Don't waste your time in social activities and social gatherings. And speaking on on social activities and social gathering, also the social media during the time of fasting. Don't waste your time on just the, the social media and in your computer and in your phone. This can take a lot of time from you. 
you need this time actually to nurture yourself with the Lord. You need actually to increase your prayers. During the, the great fast, you hear repeatedly, repeatedly, fasting and prayer, fasting and prayer, fasting and prayer. Because fasting actually does not work alone. Fasting works with prayer. The Lord said about the devil, this kind cannot come out by anything except by prayer and fasting. Together, prayer and fasting. So if you are not praying with the Agbeya at all, it is time to learn how to pray with the Agbeya. If you are praying two psalms from each hour, maybe during fasting you need to pray three or four or five psalms. If you are praying two hours a day, like first hour and the twelfth hour, again, maybe you need to add midnight prayer or the eleventh hour to your canon. Do this with the guidance of your spiritual father and focus on the connection with God during any spiritual activity. What do I mean connection with God? Prayer is not the goal. Fasting is not the goal. Reading the scripture is not the goal. All these are means to have a relationship with the Lord. Because sometimes I look at my rule or my canon as, okay, I need to finish my prayer. I need to finish my Bible reading. I need to finish the assigned book that I, I'm reading during fasting. And, oh, thank God, I finished my canon for this day. So as if the goal is to finish, to check, mark in a prayer, reading the Bible, spiritual reading, etc. This is not the goal. We pray to connect with God. We read the Bible to connect with God. We read spiritual book to connect with God. So if you are doing all these activities without connecting with God, it's not going to benefit you. You need actually to ask yourself, have I connected with the Lord in my prayer? Have I connected with the Lord when I attended midnight praises? Have I connected with the Lord in the liturgy? Or just I'm sitting there. I'm sitting there. The goal is to experience and to have this relationship with God. Not only with the guidance of your spiritual father increase your prayer, your time of reading, your time of uh, spent with the scripture, but focus also on the quality. How to connect with the Lord Every divine liturgy you attend, every midnight praises. Here, your, your visit to the Abbey, it's time actually to connect with God, to meet Him, to say with St. John, I have seen Him, I have touched Him, I have heard Him, I have listened to Him. He is not far from you. But you need actually just to focus on your relationship with Him. And you will feel him. He is inside you. He is within you. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. God is not far from you. You don't need to go and search for God. As St. Augustine said in his confession, I was searching about you and I found you inside my heart. He is within you. But you are distracted. Distracted with million of things. That's why you cannot see him. That's why you cannot listen to him. That's why you cannot touch him. But stay away from all these distractions. That's why our fathers are monks. They left the world to stay away from all these distractions in order to focus with God and to be with him only. During fasting, try to stay away from distractions and focus on on your relationship with God. When you pray, when you read the scripture, when you read spiritual books, time for meditation, time for reflection, time for silence and solitude. This time is very important. As Mar Isaac of Syria said, silence your tongue 
that your heart may speak and silence your heart that God may speak. God is speaking all the time to us, but the problem we are distracted, we are deaf. That's why the Lord, when he spoke about the proper fasting in Isaiah 58, he said, then your light shall dawn in the darkness. Your light shall dawn in the darkness. But from where I get this light? Because this is the light of Christ, as we read in verse 8, then the light shall break forth like the morning. So the light of Christ will break forth inside my heart like the morning, then I will become light to others. When Christ enlightened my heart, I will become light to others. The readings of Sunday during the Great Fast, the Church structured them in a certain way to build us spiritually. For example, this Sunday we will read about the temptation on the mountain, right? But the temptation on the mountain, when you read it in Matthew chapter 4, it happened at the end of the fasting. After the Lord fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and he was hungry, then Satan the tempter appeared to him and told him, change the the stone into bread. But why the church is reading this chapter in the second Sunday, not at the end of the fasting? Again, the church here is not going chronologically with the events in the life. But very, very early in the fasting, in the second week, the church telling us, when you fast properly, Satan will tempt you. Satan will attack you like what he did with the Lord Jesus Christ. But not to be afraid. You have the power of the word of God. As the Lord actually defeated Satan, you will be able to defeat Satan. I just spoke to you, when we fast properly, the light of God will break forth like morning inside my heart, and me, myself, I become light to the world. That's why the last Sunday, before Hosanna Sunday. The gospel is about what? The man who was born blind. This man was blind and now he is seeing. He told them, is he a sinner? When the scribe and Pharisees and the religious leaders said to the man who was born blind about Jesus, he's a sinner. He told them, is he a sinner? I do not know. But I know one thing. I was blind, and now I can see. If we fasted, the journey of fasting, if we do it properly, then at the end of the fast, we will be able to say like this man, I was blind spiritually, and now I can see. That's why the church kept this Sunday to the end. So this will be our a spiritual experience. And this Sunday is used to baptize the catechumens, those who learn it about Christianity and about Orthodoxy during the Holy Great Fast. Then the church baptizes them. The baptism is called the sacrament of enlightenment because people move from darkness to light. We are enlightened during the Holy Great Fast. And this goes with what we read in Isaiah 58, verse 8. Then the light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Means then your light shall dawn in darkness. You become a light to others. Not only you will be enlightened, but you become light to others. Many of us say we fasted for so many years, but we did not 
experience all these benefits. You know why? Because fasting for most of us, unfortunately, is just changing the type of food. And that's it. Nothing more. That's why fasting is not just changing the type of food. Fasting is a time in which we discipline our body, bring it into subjection, we nurture our spirit, we connect with God, we repent, we build ourselves spiritually. Then, if we fast in the proper way, definitely you will be enlightened. You will feel and you will experience the light of the Lord in your heart. We just finished two weeks of the fasting. We still have six weeks. It's not too late. If you did not fast until now, start now. Start from this moment. And try to apply the things that we mentioned today in your fasting in order to enjoy the power of fasting in your life. The power of the grace of God that He want to give you, to set you free, to enlighten you, to make you walk in the liberty of Christ and to be a light to the world and soul to the earth. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. When talking about the Trinity, what are some tips and advice you can give to us to help us better understand the Trinity? One of the description of God that we say it in the Divine Liturgy, incomprehensible. Incomprehensible means it is very difficult, almost impossible for our limited mind to comprehend God. But in general, theology is not done by speculation. Theology is revelation. God reveals something and we believe in it. As the Lord said to Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but Heavenly Father. So God revealed himself to us as Trinity, Triune God, three in one. That's how he revealed himself to us in Old Testament and in New Testament. That's why we believe that God is Trinity. Trinity There is no one analogy that can actually describe God 100%. But if we put some analogies together, maybe we can try to understand what Trinity looks like. So when we speak about three in one, the best analogy is like the sun and the light and the fire. These are three distinct things. Fire is not the, the, the light or the heat is not the light and the heat and the light is not the sun but they are one. It's impossible to have the sun without the light and without the heat. This gives you example how three in one but the essence of the light is different than the essence of the heat different than the essence of the sun. But when we speak about the Trinity, the all one essence. That's why this description makes us understand what does it mean to be three in one. But the weakness in this analogy is the essence. Because the essence of the heat different from the light, different from the sun. St. Athanasius gave another analogy to give us the idea of the essence. He said, if you have spring of water, and from this spring of water, water flows and make river. Here is the same essence. The river is not the spring, but the river comes from the spring. And they are one. 
the fathers tried to give different analogies, but there is no one analogy that will explain the Trinity. In the Trinity, there are attributes that common to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But there are attributes that are very unique, very unique to the Father and unique to the Son and unique to the Holy Spirit. The Father, the unique attribute for him is the paternity. He is the Father from whom the Son is born and the Holy Spirit proceeds. I cannot say the Son is a Father or the Holy Spirit is a Father. Fatherhood and the Son. What's unique about the, the Son? The filiation. He is begotten from the Father. He is begotten from the Father. And what's unique about the Holy Spirit is expression. He proceeds from the Father. So this attributes very unique. The fatherhood in the Father, the filiation in the Son, and the expression in the Holy Spirit. How do you differentiate between what it is a bonus opinion or the Holy Spirit? In the Gospel of John, Hananiah, He was an ungodly person, and he condemned the Lord Jesus Christ to death. He said in the Gospel of John, it's better that one person dies and not the whole nation perish. St. John, when he wrote his Gospel, he made a comment about this verse, or this saying of the high priest. He said he did not say this from himself, but because he was the high priest, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the life of the world. Why I'm saying this? This man was ungodly, but since he is the high priest, the Holy Spirit spoke on his mouth. He prophesied about the death of Christ for the life of the world. I'm not saying that our abonas are ungodly. I'm not saying this. But I'm saying even in the scripture we have evidence that this ungodly high priest the Holy Spirit spoke on his mouth regardless of his ungodliness he spoke on his mouth. So when you go to Abuna in confession and you ask him and he guides you. Listen to him and don't let uh, Satan cast a doubt in your heart whether these words are from God, from the Holy Spirit, or from Abuna. I'm speaking about spiritual matters. I, I will tell you what I mean. Because one of, of the things that Satan is doing, he make you doubt your spiritual father. <laughs> Once he starts making you doubting your spiritual father, you will not listen to him. Then you will listen to Satan. And Satan will destroy your life. Those who are obedient to their spiritual fathers, they are growing spiritually in the right way. And those who doubt their spiritual fathers, they struggle in their spiritual life. I said I'm speaking about about spiritual matters. Because confession is about your spiritual life. But when it comes, Abuna, should I go to this college or this college, or should I choose this career or this career, or I should get married or uh, choose monasticism? Here Abuna is shedding light to you to help you to make the right decision. But the, at the end, it is your choice. It's your decision. Abuna just give you an advice. And Abuna should not ever make a decision for you. You know what? I want you to be a accountant or a lawyer or a medical doctor. No. Abuna should just, just help you to make your decision. Like he should not tell you, 
what career you choose, what person you choose to marry, uh, what college you should go. He, he helps you only. In these things, it's your decision, 100%. But in a spiritual life, you need to listen to your spiritual father. And every word he tells you in the sacrament of the confession, it is from the Holy Spirit. Why don't Muslims believe in the resurrection when the Quran instructed them to believe in everything mentioned in the Bible? Many times the problem is the interpretation of the verses. For example, I speak about Muslims. Let's speak, for example, with all my respect to about Protestant. Read John chapter 6. John chapter 6 speaks very, very clearly about the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Real body and real blood. And they believe in the scripture. And they love the scripture. And they memorize the scripture. But they provide personal interpretation, not the divine interpretation for these verses. In the same way, People, when they read Quran or read, no, so they, they provide personal interpretation to the verses they are reading. When you fast, are you supposed to feel the growth? What can one do if they cannot feel any growth or any difference in their life? You will not feel the growth instantly. For example, after you eat, you don't feel that you are growing. But if you compare yourself today with one year ago or five years ago, then you can see you are growing. At the same time, you will not feel the growth instantly. But when you compare yourself like from the beginning of the great fast or after the great fast, you should feel some differences. in in your life. For example, we are here in a monastery, many sometimes brothers or monks come to me and say, I I feel I'm not growing. So I ask him, since the time you enter the monastery and right now, are you the same or different? He said, no, different. Uh, In many, many areas, only then you are growing. You will not feel the growth immediately, instantly, but You should be growing. If you see yourself today and five years ago, then you should see growth. If there is no growth, then there is a spiritual obstacle here hindering your growth. You need to discuss it with your spiritual father to see what is it and how you overcome it. How do I get myself to a point where I want to fast? And I am not feeling like I am forced to fast. The Lord Jesus Christ said the kingdom of God is taken by force. And this is the narrow gate. This is the difficult way. You need to force yourself. Not somebody else forcing you. But you need to push yourself and force yourself to fast. Because this is the right thing to do. We need to do what is right, not what's convenient. For example, it is convenient not to go to school and not to study. It's convenient. But is it the right thing? No, it's not the right thing. It's convenient not to work. But is it the right thing? If people choose not to go to work, they cannot survive. We we need to do what's right. And this is part of disciplining our flesh and bring it into subjection. Here, why you are forcing yourself to fast? Why you are pushing yourself to fast? Because you know the benefit of fasting. It is for your own benefit. Why people, when they are sick, they force themselves to do surgery or to take medicine? or people suffering from cancer, they do chemotherapy, although it's very painful. Why Why they go through all of this? Because there is healing 
at the end. And I know there is a spiritual hearing, spiritual enlightenment. So if I am convinced with the benefit of fasting, it will be easy for me to, if you want to use the word force, to force myself to fast. What is a story you can think of from the Desert Fathers that's beneficial for fasting or that helped you? Do you know this picture at the end? The the last picture on the northern wall? Do you know this icon about? Amber Sanius. Do you know the story? And Arsenius, when they start to eat together, he was picking and chose the good beans and leaving the, the bad beans to his brothers. And because he was wealthy, he was the teacher of the emperor children. So the abbot was embarrassed to confront him. He said to one of the monks, when you eat, I want you to pick the best beans like Abba Arsanius, then I will slap you and I tell you this is wrong. So here you can see how the abbot is slapping the monk across from St. Arsanius because he is picking and choosing the best beans. And Abba Arsanius uh, in, in blue putting his uh, hand, his palm on his face and said, oh, this slap is for you, Arsani. He knew that the abbot was embarrassed to confront him, so he did it to the other monk, but he deserved this. And he said, I am expert in in language and in uh, literature, but I don't know how to eat the bean properly, like the monks. So that's a a story about fasting. Uh, Fasting, again, uh, it's not about picking and choosing. Fasting is simplicity. Fasting is uh, to discipline your body and to bring it into subjection. What does begotten mean? Begotten means born, but not physical birth when you speak about the son is begotten from the father. Like when the light is begotten from the sun. Here, begotten means this, come from that, not the opposite. Yeah, the sun, S-U-N, sun did not come from the light, but the light comes from the sun. In the same way, the sun, S-O-N, is born from the Father for all ages, not the opposite, like how the light comes from the sun. That's why we say in the creed, begotten, not created. The sun is not created. He is begotten. True God of true God. Like light comes from the sun. I have a sin that's eating me. I really need to repent. But every time I do and confess, I fall back into it. I really want to overcome it this fast. What do I do? I'm glad that you are determined through the grace of God to overcome this sin. And through the grace of God, you will be able to overcome it. Number one, you need actually to rely on the grace of God. Every morning, you need to ask the grace of God to help you to overcome this sin. Number two, all the day, you need to fight the good fight. Don't yield into temptation. Be strong. Run away from every temptation. Run away from every temptation. Every night, examine yourself and see if you were able to overcome the temptation, what helped you. And following day, focus on what helped you. If out of weakness, you fall in sin, see what are the reasons, and then try to avoid this reason the following day. 
If every morning you ask it for grace, all the day you are fighting the good fight, at the night examining yourself and trying the following day would be better than the previous day, through the grace of God you will overcome it. Of course, there are more exercises that can help you. I have a sermon on, uh, you can find it on South Cloud. It is called The Beloved Sin. Some sins are dear to us. We don't want to give it up. And some sins are addictive, habitual. And usually fighting against the sin that we love and the sins that are habits is more challenging. So in this sermon, I give many practical points to help you how to overcome these sins. You can find it if you search the beloved sin. Uh, Amber Yusuf, or I can send it to the Father and the Father can share it with you. Uh, it's on SoundCloud. It's very, e- very easy to find it. Yeah. How to get rid of bad thoughts quickly? Uh, distracting them. The Father spoke about distracting the thoughts. Don't dwell on the thought. When you are attacked with a bad thought, try to distract doing something else. Even go and talk to somebody. Not about the soul, just talk about him uh, with somebody about anything else. Uh, You can pray, you can read a book, you can uh, watch uh, something that distracts your mind from the, the thought. You need to find what help you to distract the thought. The thought is like a magnet pulling you in this direction. You need to find a stronger magnet to pull you in the opposite direction. That's distracting your thoughts. How can I help a family member to hate a sin that they enjoy doing? Pray for them. Talk to them directly if they are willing to listen. If they are not willing to listen, then you can talk to them indirectly. For example, you can share indirectly a story from the life of the saints, a verse from the scripture, a sermon that you heard it, just share it with them. So indirectly, you can share with them some messages to help them to hit uh, sin. And number three, do not enable them. What do I mean by do not enable them? In the story of the prodigal son, if the father sent some money to his son and some food, the son would not return at all. But when he stopped sending him money and sending him food, and the son start to feel the need, he returned back to his house. Sometimes we enable people. When we enable them, we empower them to continue in their sinful life. That's why we should not enable the people. How do we discipline the flesh, whether in fasting or in general? How do we force ourselves to do things that aren't easy? Through the grace of God, I can do all things in Jesus Christ who strengthens me. If you do it by yourself, you will fail. But every morning you need to ask for the grace of God to be with you, to empower you, to discipline your flesh. Flesh is like a horse. If you don't tame this horse and control it, he will actually hurt you. But if you put the horse under the control, then it will serve you. If we put the flesh under control, the flesh will serve the spirit. And you cannot do this except by the grace of God. An exercise. It's not from day one uh, you will be able to discipline your flesh 100%. It is a journey, lifelong journey. But you need to work on it. How to discipline your flesh and bring it into subjection. And through the grace of God, 
when you do these exercises, you will actually grow spiritual. How do we get rid of the distraction of the world? You need actually to make a conscious decision to stay away from distraction. Yeah, many people actually, they found themselves, they are distracted by the social media. So they closed all their social media. One of the major distractions in our life are social media. Especially we don't know how, how to use it properly. Then if this is a distraction from you, you need to stay away. We need to have this strong determination, serious determination. If something actually is hindering my spiritual growth, I will stay away from it. The fathers, the martyrs, they shed their blood. I'm not asking you to shed your blood, but I'm asking you to stay away from any distraction that actually hinder your spiritual growth. How do you fear God? When you feel His presence, if we don't feel the presence of God, then we will not be able to fear Him. If you don't feel His presence, just remind yourself with the presence of God. If I'm telling you this meeting is recorded audio and video and live streamed, you will be careful about any word you are saying, because this word, the whole world will watch it and see it. It's recorded. In the same way, when you bring to your mind that God is watching over you, then you will walk in his presence. St. Paul, in one of his letters, said, I want you not to obey me in my presence, but in my absence more than my presence. Just the presence of St. Paul among the community make everybody be watchful and careful. Then when St. Paul leaves, they do whatever they want to do. In the same way, when we feel the presence of God among us, when we know God is here watching over us, then we will walk in the fear of God. But we forget this. We forget that God is present with us all the time. What if I do not want to repent and confess of a certain sin because I am afraid of the responsibility that comes with my repentance if it is true? This question is like, I have a cancer, but I don't want to go to the doctor because I'm afraid he will tell me that you need surgery and you need chemotherapy. So I choose not to go to the doctor. Okay, you will die. Is this what you want? You need to be wise even to take the responsibility. But this actually will heal. If you don't take the the treatment, and if you don't take the responsibility, and if you don't repent and confess your sins, then actually you will die spiritually. Is this what you want? Is this wise to choose to die spiritually? No. And God is a good physician. God wants to help you. God wants to set you free. So don't be afraid. You are coming to a tender-hearted, a kind, loving Father who cares about you, who loves you, who will not condemn you, who will not judge you. He said to the woman that was caught in sin, I will not judge you. The judge of the whole world, he told her, I will not judge you. So don't be afraid. God wants you to return back to him, to heal you and to help you. Please read the book Life of Repentance and Purity by His Holiness Bob Shenouda. Please read this book. Take this book as your spiritual reading during the time of fasting. Life of Repentance and Purity. How do I make myself constantly grow spiritually and never have a fall back? How you grow physically? You exercise, you eat healthy food, you rest and take enough sleep. 
That's how you grow health. In the same way, when you nourish your spirit, discipline your body, follow spiritual exercises, then you will be growing spiritually. Do aliens exist from a Christian perspective? There is nothing in the scripture about the existence of aliens. We don't know whether they exist or not. The Bible did not tell us anything about it. And until now, there is no scientific evidence, 100% about the existence of aliens. What do you do when you cannot pay attention in prayer? I think this because of distraction. That's why when you pray in your in a room, try to pray with a soft voice. Even if you memorize the prayer, hold the Akbaya and read it. So when you look with your eye, when you speak with your voice, when you hear it with your ear, and when your body participates with your spirit, for example, we worship you, O Christ, with your good Father and the Holy Spirit, or I beat my chest, or I lift up my hands, or I bow to you, or I kneel. When you do all these things, it will help you to pay attention in prayer. Why are lustful thoughts bad? It's a stealing. You lust after things you don't own. And it will defile your mind, and defile your heart, and defile your spirit. The Lord spoke about lust as adultery. He said, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you committed adultery in your heart. How do you manage your spiritual canon with your super busy schedule? How do we have better, how do you have better time management? Just do better, better time management. <laughs> All of us, we waste a big portion of our time. And you need to keep the balance between what is important and what's urgent. When you speak about important and urgent, you will have four choices. Some tasks are both important and urgent. Tasks are important and not urgent. Tasks are urgent and not important. And tasks are non-important and non-urgent. All of us, we agree that number one priority, important and urgent. And number four priority is non-important, non-urgent. Most of us don't agree what comes number two, urgent and not important, or important or not urgent. What do you think? Number two should be important, not urgent, or urgent, not important. Hmm? Urgent, not important. Important, not urgent. Hmm. If you agree, important, not urgent, number two, raise your hand, Kevin. Okay. If you agree, urgent, not important, number two, raise your hand. I see the majority. Okay. If it is not important, then the, the sense of urgency is a false sense of urgency because it's not important. But as you see here, and most of you raised their hand for urgent and not important. And this is what waste our time. For example, you are praying in the church and attending the divine liturgy. Divine liturgy is important. Then while you are praying, your phone sends you a notification, there is a text message. With this text message, you feel it's urgent to check it. But is it important? It's not important. But most of us would check the phone and see the text message and read it and reply to it. Then we distract it to come to focus back in prayer. You cannot. Because you give priority to what seems urgent but not important. Right? We waste a lot of time. If actually you are careful in time management, then 
you will be able, even you are super busy, to keep between your work or your study and your spiritual canon, etc. The Lord, in the feeding the multitude, told them, collect the fragments. So there is fragments of time, five minutes here, ten minutes here, fifteen minutes here. If you collect this fragment and pray a psalm here, the creed here, Holy God, Holy Mighty here, actually you will be able to be a life of prayer all the time. Somebody is asking about stories from my time with His Holiness Bob Shenouda. Most of you, if you don't deal with Sayyidina Bob Shenouda on a personal level, you saw His Holiness with the reverence of, of His Holiness. But when you deal with Him, you, you can see the, the real fatherhood, the compassion, the kindness, the love, the care. One time I was even, uh, yeah, I was not even a monk. I was a youth spending some time in Ambab Shoi Monastery uh, as a youth, like you spending time right now. And uh, I was walking in the desert by myself and I found his son in front of me because he was also taking a walk. <laughs> so I went, I greeted him and uh, yeah, I had a sister who had a surgery at that time. So just I asked him to pray for her. So he asked me for her name, which meant a lot to me. He is not just saying, Rabbana ma'ahum khalas. The fact he asked for her name means he will take this name and will pray for her. And just when he asked me what's her name, this touched me very much. Uh, I felt a father cares about his children. And when I asked him to pray, it's not just going to tell me, uh, God be with her and that's it. No. He's taking the name and, and will pray. This is a very small story because of the time, but there are many, many, many beautiful memories with his son, Bob Shenouda. May his prayers be with all of us. What is the right perspective on creation 7,000 years ago or millions, billions? Many conflicting opinion on this. Okay. How you calculate the day, 24 hours, it is the movement of the earth around itself and the movement of the earth around the sun, right? The sun was created when? On the fourth day. Then the six days of creation, definitely not 24 days, because the sun was created on the fourth day. Every day can be billions and billions and billions of of years and we are still living in the seventh day the seventh day will end by the the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal life will be the eighth day of creation so the six days of creation are just six days every day is 24 hours no it's not how to stop judging people like the thoughts that just come in our mind or how to stop that from happening? Turn the thought into prayer. When a thought comes to your mind, see what he is doing, pray for this person and pray for yourself. This is the best antidote for judging. To turn the thought of judging, if I tell you somebody has heart attack, what are you going to do? going to call the ambulance for him, right? In the same way, if you see your brother sinning, you need to call the ambulance for him. You need to pray for him. That's the question. What is the best channel of charity that your eminence recommend to give to the poor versus church expenses and services? Okay. You need to to do both. Actually, we need to help the poor. That's very, very important. But also we need to contribute toward the church expenses because the church, the utilities, the construction, the the mortgage, all these expenses, who will will pay it? 
if all of us, all of us, we give 100% of our donations to the poor, then the church that's serving us, who actually will take care of it? So we need to be wise. Yes, we definitely, definitely, the, the, we need to give the poor, well, I can also we need to be responsible for the churches that are serving us and taking care of us. I don't support any organization that work independent of the church. But I support organizations that are under the umbrella of the church. So there are many organizations work under direct supervision of the church. Like here in the Southern Diocese, we have hope, uh, help other people excel. In uh, the Diocese of Los Angeles, you have St. Verena Charity. In um, New Jersey, there is Bless UA. It is under the bishopric of the social services served by Bishop Julius under uh, the supervision of Pope Tawadros. And I'm sure in all the dioceses in uh, Pennsylvania, New York, in uh, Detroit, in uh, Kentucky, in, in, in Virginia, in all uh, the dioceses, every diocese have a charitable organization. And I recommend highly to donate to the poor through this charitable organization. I don't recommend, I don't support at all. I know there are many organizations uh, working, but not under the direct uh, supervision of the church. I don't support all these organizations. Because I don't believe that uh, if we are one body and one, the church is one body, I don't understand why some organization help not under the church. Yeah, I don't understand this. We are one body. And so all of us, we need to be serving to. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.